Before we actually start, I, I do want to make a couple of comments on some of the homework, the homework that's due this week. Um, actually, it's due on Wednesday. <coughs> There's a couple of problems where the book is, um, I don't know, let's just say a little bit misleading, perhaps. So, on problem 4-9, just a little hint on this one. Um, they tell you that it's a constant temperature problem, but we don't have any boundary work equations that specifically apply for constant temperature processes. But it's a two-phase mixture, isn't it, in problem 4.9? And if the temperature remains constant and we're in the saturation region, then the pressure remains constant too, right? Okay, so there's your hint. Um, right, 4.9 is a constant pressure problem, even though it doesn't say anywhere in there that it's a constant pressure problem, it has to be. So that's an issue that um, might give you some guidance on number nine. On number 14, it actually shows you, well, first of all, it tells you that it's a polytropic process, right? Um, and then it also tells you that you've got a piston cylinder device and it's frictionless. Um, and it says that you're compressing the gas, it's nitrogen gas that's inside that cylinder. Um, but if you look at the diagram, you know, it shows a vertical cylinder and it tells you in the problem statement that it's frictionless. So you might look at all that and say, oh, well, Miller said that that must mean that it's a constant pressure process. But it isn't. Um, it's only a constant pressure process if it's a frictionless vertical piston cylinder device and the piston is free to move such that it only maintains a constant downwards pressure because of its constant weight and the constant uh, atmospheric pressure above it. Um, this is not like that. Here you have a piston and presumably you or a machine of yours is pushing. It tells you that we're compressing that gas. So that piston is not free to move. This is not a constant pressure problem. So solve it as a polytropic process, not a constant pressure process because it's not a constant pressure process. Also keep in mind that it's, an, it, that it's a gas. So we have a relationship, our ideal gas equation, that relates PV and MRT. So it's that temperature data through PV equals MRT that will allow you to find your product of pressure times volume. So that's another little hint. And then the last hint is on problem 114. Um, I think it's the second part of the problem. It says when the piston first starts to move, what, uh, I'm sorry, how much liquid is there? It's a trick question, okay? If you've tried that problem, you will note that state point two is outside of the saturation region. Uh, I'm not going to tell you which way, but um, if it's in the saturation region, well, then the amount of liquid is based on one minus the quality, but um, it's not in the saturation region anymore. So they really shouldn't have asked you the question quite the way they did. It, it, you know, by asking how much liquid there is, it kind of implies that you end as a two-phase mixture, but, but it's not. So, you know, again, that's just a hint on number 114 that you know, might help you out. So you know, sometimes the author does this. He's not as clear as perhaps he could be. And you know, if I notice a lot of students having issues like on this problem, like I had this week, then I'll try to point it out in class. All right, yeah. So this definition is 8, 137, and 32. Yes. Yeah, it's not a tangle. It's 137. All right. Um, yeah, I'd like to assign a certain number of problems from the review section. Every chapter has a review section in the very last section. Um, kind of miscellaneous problems, uh, okay. and I, I um, yeah, I like to assign some of those as well. So yeah, that, that's, yeah, 137 is from the final section called review problems. You know, 32 is just whatever. Um, I assigned it in this order because that corresponds to the order that we've covered the material. So um, I mean, I guess technically it's out of numerical order, but it's in chronological order based on our class. All right, so. Another fun day of thermodynamics. Um, by the way, let me remind you that you have your first midterm coming up next Monday. Um, I've also, <laughs> I've, also <laughs> I've also mentioned that um, it's going to be a closed book exam. You're not going to be allowed to use a note sheet or anything. All you'll have are property table handouts. So, yeah, you want to memorize a few things. You certainly want to memorize, or maybe I should say, 
I like the word memorize. You have to know how to use the, t the tables, right? The given properties, you have to figure out what tables to use. You, you have to know how to use a ideal gas equation of state. Uh, you have to know um, the first law of thermodynamics. You have to know, you know, Q equals change in internal energy plus kinetic and potential energy plus the work. I mean, those are things you just have to know. You have to know how to solve for boundary work. You know, integral of PVV is boundary work. Those are things you have to, to remember. Um, I pretty much given you now everything you really have to remember. And I think once you start solving enough of these problems, you realize you'll see the same equations over and over again. You use the data from the tables the same way over and over again. Um, yeah, it might seem kind of tough knowing that your first thermal midterm is going to be a uh, closed book exam, but that's just the way it is. Also, on my first thermal midterm in college, I got a D. So maybe I'm going to take it all out on you guys. <laughs> um, the lowest grade I got in any test in college. So. I'm not proud, but now I teach this stuff. So, you know, if I could figure it out, you could figure it out. All right, so let's get back to what we were talking about last time. And we're talking about um, a new set of thermodynamic properties, two of them, right? One we call the specific heat at constant pressure, and one we call the specific heat at constant volume. So, by definition, the specific heat at constant volume is the partial derivative of the specific internal energy with respect to temperature holding volume constant. And the other property called specific heat at constant pressure is the partial of the specific enthalpy with respect to temperature holding pressure constant. Um, this is what we ended with last time. Keep in mind that these are thermodynamic properties. U is a property, T is a property, V is a property. Um, any mathematical combination of properties can also be considered a thermodynamic property. So enthalpy, we defined as U plus PV, that's a property. Um, this is not enthalpy, but this is certainly properties that are based on mathematical relationships to other properties. So these are properties. And they're also intensive properties, okay? If we look at the units of internal energy and temperature, um, we'll find that the units are, are indeed specific. In other words, you'll have mass in the denominator. Um, for both of these, the units are just going to be, um, well, energy per unit mass per unit temperature. So in other words, kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin. Or, you know, it could be BTUs per pound mass per degree ranking. Um, you know, just depending upon whether we have the British or the SI system of units. But, those are properties that we're going to have to deal with, and that's what we're going to start talking about today. Is, um, is the partial multiplied by the volume and the pressure, or? No, no, no. Th this is just our notation for partial derivative, right? Okay. Partial derivative, constant. That, that, that's just why we you know, put the D down here at the bottom. There's, there's no multiplication. This is just the definition, and this is used as a standard notation for partial derivative. Um, I also want to remind you that we call this specific heat of constant volume because the volume is held constant during the partial derivative. It, it has nothing to do with a constant volume process or not. It's a property. It can be used for any process like you would do for any property. Same thing with pressure, right? It's called specific heat of constant pressure because we hold the pressure constant during the taking of this partial derivative. It has nothing to do with being a constant pressure process. Again, it's a property. It can be used for any process just like we would. The question now becomes, what do we use these for? And there's really two major applications. One is for ideal gases, and the other is for liquids. So let us begin with ideal gases. So we will note that for an ideal gas, and, and this is just based on observation and experimentation, what we find is that U and H are strong functions of temperature. Um, so I'll just put our strong function of T, um, but very weak functions of volume or pressure. All right. Now, with this in mind, um, and again, I'll have to have you think about material perhaps you learned in your math class, you should have learned it. Um, if you have a partial derivative like 
well, like CP and CV are, right? Um, you'll notice that since U is a strong function of temperature but not volume, um, and since H is a strong function of temperature but not pressure, you can actually convert these partial derivatives into regular derivatives, right? So for this particular situation, and maybe I'll just write it this way, I'll just put therefore, CV is approximately equal to simply du dt, and CP is approximately equal to dht. So this is just something that hopefully we remember from our math classes, and if we don't, that's okay, it's really down here. Now, how does this help us? Well, hopefully it's becoming clear. I'll now put therefore, I can just rearrange both these two equations above, right? Um, I can say therefore that du is approximately equal to CV dt, and I can say that dh will be approximately equal to CP dt. And then this is a little squiggly up here. Right. So they're approximations, but they're actually very good approximations. If you look at the data, U and H primarily just vary with temperature. They just don't vary as pressure or volume change. Now, I have these two differential equations. Uh, now I could just integrate. And by the way, I'm kind of doing two at the same time, right? I'm looking at, C, I'm sorry, I'm looking at internal energy and I'm looking at enthalpy essentially simultaneously. I'm putting them side by side. So if we integrate, um, then for the first equation, we'll simply get u2 minus u1 is going to equal the integral from 1 to 2 of cv dt. And you know, I'm just going to drop the approximation sign at this point. We'll just assume that it's close enough to true equality. So for the internal energy equation, I would get this equation, and then when I integrate the enthalpy equation, I'm just going to get that the enthalpy change is the integral from 1 to 2 of CPPT. Uh, by the way, we're still in chapter 4, right? We're still talking about closed systems. Point 1 still represents the initial state, 2 still represents the final state. We're, we're not changing any of that. But look at what I've done. I now have equations in terms of these new properties, CP and CV, that allow me to get an internal energy change or an enthalpy change. And don't I need at least the internal energy change for solving first law problems for closed systems? Well, sure I do, right? The heat transfer is equal to change in internal energy plus the work. Or for a constant pressure problem, the heat transfer is equal to change in enthalpy. The internal energy and work have been combined. So this allows me to find the needed change in internal energy enthalpy for ideal gases. And again, this only applies to ideal gases. Okay. Now, these two equations uh, collectively, I'm just gonna call them equation A, and we'll get back to them. Now, how would we find values of internal energy enthalpy change? Well, what I need to do is I need to find values of CP and or CV that are functions of temperature. I need a functional relationship, if you will, between CV and temperature. If I have such a relationship, then I just plug it into the equation and, and, and integrate, and that's going to give me the value of the internal energy change. So what we'll note here is that the data that does give me a relationship between the specific heat and temperature, um, the data is in table A2 part C, um, and it's actually a polynomial I think it's a fourth order or maybe third order, order polynomial. Let's find out. All right, so this is A2 part A. Here's A2 part B. There's A2 part C. Um, you can see what it gives you. Oh, and I guess I'm going to have to have our producer uh, put the computer up onto one of the screens now. It'll get there eventually unless got unplugged like last week. Good, thank you. So you can see the equation at the very top. It actually gives you an equation for CP bar, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, and it's entirely a function of temperature. It's polynomial, right? You can see it's of the form A plus BT plus CT squared plus DT to the cube. Those are the easiest ones to integrate, aren't they? You know, the integral of T is just 
1 half t squared, the integral of t squared is 1 third t cubed, the integral of t cubed is 1 quarter t4, right? So it's an easy one to integrate. So that's why they put them into this polynomial form. So Cp um, is a function of temperature in this particular equation. Now, why Cp bar? Um, keep in mind that whenever you see a bar over something, and we, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, that means it's a molar quantity. Okay. And the only difference between the mass quantities and the molar quantities is the molar mass, right? So if we needed Cp, um, Cp, um, let's see, that would just be Cp bar, which is going to have the units, and let's just write it in the SI units, that would be kilojoules per kilomole per degree Kelvin, and those are the units that are shown up there, right? Kilojoules per kilomole per degree Kelvin, it's in red right underneath the polynomial equation. Um, and then we divide it by the molar mass, um, which has units of kilograms per kilomole. You can see that the kilomoles cancels, and you end up with the units of kilojoules per kilogram per kelvin, which are the proper units for Cp. Now, you might also note that there's no value for Cv or even Cv bar up there, and that's something, pardon me, that's something we'll get to in just, just a few minutes. So we'll see how to find one given the other. All right, so. The way we would find the internal energy change, or I should really say one way that we'd find this internal energy change or enthalpy change is to find Cp or Cv as functions of temperature, plug them into the integral above there, and, and just do the integral, and then you have your results. However, this is still rather cumbersome. I mean, as straightforward as integrating a third order polynomial is, it's still an integration process. It's still going to take some time. But there are two simplifications that we often use that will make our life a lot easier for us. So, two simplifications. All right, so here's the first simplification. Uh, oh, that's supposed to be a one. And this is negative five. All right, so the first simplification is to use Cp as a, or Cv as a constant at the average temperature of the problem. So use Cp and or Cv as a constant at the average temperature. And in fact, if we do though, we use the following notation. Um, instead of just writing these as Cp or Cv, we'll actually write it as Cp average and Cv average. So it'll be very obvious that we're using a constant value um, that's taken at the average temperature of the problem. Okay. Um, now, if it's a constant taken at um, that average temperature, then that makes the integration super easy, right? I mean, u2 minus u1 is going to be equal to the integral of oops, Cv dt from 1 to 2. But if Cv is a constant, then that means that it comes out of the integral, which means that it's just Cv average times the temperature change. And the same thing happens with the, with the enthalpy, right? Um, if we integrate this from 1 to 2 of Cp dt, if Cp is a constant, then it comes out of the integral as just Cp average. And then the integral from 1 to 2 of dt is just t2 minus t1, so this becomes Cp average times t2 minus t1. Okay. So these equations are easier to use. And collectively, I'll just call these equation B here for today. And here what we want to do is we want to use data in table A2, part B. Uh, by the way, there's the English units, right? There's A2E, part A, B, and C. So let's go to that table. That's just the one above. Um, and it actually gives us this information, but unfortunately, it's only for like six different gases. Okay. For part C, I'll go back to that, it lists some 20 different gases, but for part B of the table, it only gives us six gases. So if we have any of these six different gases that are listed, 
um, then that means we can go ahead and use the data at the average temperature. We'd have to know what the average temperature is. Um, we just go into the table at whatever, whatever average temperature we happen to have. Maybe we have to interpolate. Um, but in any event, you just go into the table, and you can see that there is both CP and CV data up here in these tables. So uh, this is generally what we're going to do. Okay? We're generally not going to do any integration. We're generally just going to find the average temperature. Sometimes what we do is we guess or estimate the average temperature, use it as if it were accurate, and then at the end of the problem, determine what that average temperature truly is and then see if our initial guess was okay. Um, but more often than not, we'll know the temperature change for a process. And again, these are only for ideal gases. Okay, so uh, this is the most common. Now, remember, there are two simplifications. So let's look at the third simplification. So another dot. Okay, this other simplification, we're still going to use CP um, and or CV as a constant, but this time at what we just call room temperature. So nominally room temperature is like, what, 20 degrees Celsius, um, you know, kind of standard atmospheric temperature. And um, well, maybe that's not quite right. I guess it's 27 degrees Celsius, at least in your textbook, which is 300 Kelvin. But nonetheless, um, we're still going to assume that they're constants. But instead of taking it at the average temperature, we're just going to take it at room temperature. And we basically use this notation and we're going to use CP with the subscript O and CVO. So if you see a CPO or a CVO, then you, then you know that that is the specific heat at constant pressure or specific heat at constant volume, but at this particular room temperature. Now, what about the internal energy or enthalpy change? Well, again, it's really easy. Um, I, I don't know that I need to go through it all again, but just like we had up here above, um, the CV is going to come out of the integral, and instead of calling it CV average, we'll just call it CVO. And it becomes CVO times the temperature change. The same thing with the enthalpy change, right? It'll be CPO times the temperature change. So. Therefore, we can write that the internal energy change, U2 minus U1, is CVO times the temperature change, and the enthalpy change, H2 minus H1, is CPO times the temperature change. And collectively, why don't I just call these Um, now, this is fairly common as well, um, not quite as common as using the average temperature, but this is still pretty common, and the data is basically in table A2 part A. So here's table A2 part A, 300 degrees Kelvin is considered room temperature, and not for as many gases as table A2C, but, you know, for what, a dozen or so different gases, it gives me the value of CP as well as the value of CP, uh, CV. So we just go into the table, we pull out the value, we plug it in to the equation, and we get our internal energy change or our enthalpy change. Okay, so I, I think it's really pretty straightforward. Um, now, again, we use this in the first law problems, right? I'm not just doing this because it's fun, which it kind of is, but, well, at least for me. Um, but we're doing it because we need data that we don't necessarily have. You know, there's so many gases out there, there just is not a full set of thermodynamic property data for dozens and dozens of gases like there is for water and R134A, which are used every day in our industrial world. So sometimes all we have is specific heat data, and we have to use that specific heat data using either equations A, B, or C above, 
in order to find the internal energy or enthalpy change for use in the first law. So that's really what this all comes down to. Now, I'll give you an example in a moment. Um, just um, a few last things. We call it some other information. There are relationships between CP and CV that we do not have the ability to derive at this point in thermodynamics. Okay, um, in your next course in thermodynamics 302, when you get into um, what are called thermodynamic property relations, which are basically integral and differential relationships between all sorts of different thermodynamic properties, then we can derive the equation that I'm about to put on the board now. We do need those equations now, though, to solve some problems. So I'm just going to give you some other information, and you're just going to have to accept that these equations are true. But the author of your book does exactly the same thing. He presents these things and then pretty much says, I will derive them later. So here's the information. First of all, believe it or not, the difference between the specific unit constant pressure and that of constant volume is the gas constant, R. Hard to believe, but true. Another thing is that, um, remember how we talked about these molar values of specific heats? The difference between the molar specific heat of constant pressure and the molar specific heat of constant volume is equal to the universal gas constant, R universal. Um, another thing to note is that there's something that we call the ratio of specific heats. K is simply defined as Cp over Cv, and it's just called ratio of specific heats. Now that is not something that we're going to use immediately, but it is something that will be used eventually. So, you know, this is the time when I should identify this to you. And then lastly, um, I'll just put these over the side here. Uh, we talked about Cp and Cp bar. We talked about how Cp was Cp bar over M. And similarly, Cv is going to be Cv bar over the molar mass M. So this just gives you a, a set of relationships that can't be derived at this point, but you know, are something we're going to have to use. <coughs> OK. Yes? When you say K, that's not Kelvin, right? No, 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 this is not the Kelvin. This is just the ratio of specific heat, so it's called K. And in fact, you can see this very last column here on um, table A2, part A, um, that's K. So we, we use that for a lot of problems involving gases, but not yet. That, that's beyond us at this point. We will use it eventually, but, but not quite yet. So there are problems where you need K, it's here. There's problems where you need Cp and Cv, it's here at room temperature, it's here at a variety of other temperatures for various gases, and then it's here as a polynomial for lots and lots of different gases. But again, with the understanding that we're typically going to use one of the simplifications. Now, before we get to that point, though, let me go through an example problem. And this example is in your book. It's problem number 54. So um, let me just close this for the moment. So this is actually from your edition of the book. So it looks like that's pretty good. So let me just read this problem to you. It's very straightforward. It says, determine the internal energy change of hydrogen in kilojoules per kilogram. I don't know why they said that. Um, as it is heated from 200 to 800 degrees Kelvin. That's the problem. But it wants you to do it three ways. A, using the empirical specific heat equation as a function of temperature. In other words, A2 part C. Um, wow, it looks like that's a link. No, but not on my computer. It's not a link. I guess in your electronic books, you can click on like the table links and that'll take you right to the tables, right? Um, anyway, so you solve it using the value of, well, Cp or Cv, whatever we use as a function of temperature. In part B, we're going to use Cv at the average temperature, so that's the first simplification. Um, in other words, the data from A2 part B. And then the third time, we want to do it using Cv at room temperature. In other words, the data in A2 part B. So it's a very straightforward problem. So let me just illustrate that. Um, in all likelihood, I'm going to skip some steps because integrating is going to take a whole lot of time and we don't really need to spend all that time. I mean, again, it's a simple integration. It's polynomial. So, all right, so it's problem 454. 
Um, basically, we want to find the change in internal energy for hydrogen gas from 200 to 800 Kelvin. Problem. And then, you know, part A of the problem wants us to use the you know, equation for C, P, or C, D as a function of temperature. So that's what we're going to do first. Um, I'm not going to write down the part A, part B, part C. It, it's in the problem statement. Um, you know, of course, if this is your homework, you'd want to rewrite the problem so you have a standalone document to study from. But here, um, I'll just go through one more quickly. Now, I don't need to show any diagrams here. We're not trying to find heat or work. We're we not going through any processes. I'm just trying to make sure that you understand the nature of these particular equations. So, how do we do that? So, if we find the change in internal energy, which means V2 minus V1, then this is just the integral of Cv dt. Sometimes you show it this way. You show it Cv as a function of temperature dt. Um, note that this is not... CV times a temperature, right? It's CV as a function of temperature, like you would have seen in your math classes. And the problem is, when we go to that table, now I'm going to go back to those tables. So here's a table again. Um, you can see hydrogen is right up here at the top, and it gives you the coefficients for the polynomial, right? Everything's in the form of Cp bar equals A plus Bt plus Ct squared plus Dt cubed. So we have A, B, C, and D. Um, it should be pretty easy to integrate. But there's a problem, right? There's no CV data. It's all Cp. I go to the end of this table, and that's it. I'm on to table A3. So what do we do? How do we find CV when all we have is CP bar? Well, that's why I gave you some of those other relationships. Um, we would note, um, first of all, that CV is CV bar over the molar mass. But we also know that CP bar minus CV bar is the universal gas constant. So we can actually replace the CV bar with a CP bar minus universal gas constant over M. So this is then what gets plugged in above. So we plug that in above, and we get U2 minus V1 is equal to CP bar minus R universal over M. Now again, Cp is the function of temperature. I, I could and perhaps should have just shown this Cp as a function of temperature just to make sure it's really clear. And that is in the table. So we say then that this is equal to, uh oh, I forgot my integration sign. And I forgot my, oh no, the Bt was there, I just forgot the integration. And we're integrating between state point one and state point two. So now we can plug in the equation that's shown on the handout. Right, so um, this is where I'm going to start skipping some steps. Um, we have basically Cp bar as a function of temperature. It's called an integral, <coughs> so it's basically the integral from 1 to 2 of A plus Bt plus Ct squared plus Dt cubed minus universal gas constant over the molar mass. Um, when we integrate that on T, so this becomes a t plus one half b t squared plus one third c t cubed plus one fourth d t to the fourth um, minus. And now our universal is a constant. So when you integrate that, it becomes our universal t. So we have our universal times t. And then the molar mass is is just a constant is going to come out of the integral. So there's a 1 over m here. And then this is evaluated. Um, actually, I should have held off on those square brackets. Um, this is then evaluated between T1 of 200 Kelvin and T2 of 800 Kelvin. 
So, I mean, you know how to do this, right? You just plug it in at state point two, and then you subtract from it the results at state point one. Now, this is where I say, if I had to start plugging in all the numbers and going through a whole bunch of mathematics, this is going to take forever. Um, I, I will look up the molar mass. Um, it doesn't give the molar mass here, so you'd actually have to go back to the A1, which is, of course, what we've seen all the molar mass data. And for hydrogen gas, it's 2.016. So I'll just say this is 2.016 um, kilograms per kilomole, um, and that's from table A1. Um, anyway, I'm going to skip all the steps. You go through the mathematics, you do the integration, you plug in, you chug away, and we end up with 6,194 kilojoules per kilogram. Um, Keep in mind that the units for the molar specific heat constant pressure, as well as the universal gas constant, are the same, right? They're kilojoules per kilomole per degree Kelvin. When we divide it by the molar mass, it becomes kilojoules per kilogram per degree Kelvin. But then, as we integrate over temperature, it gets multiplied by the units of Kelvin, so we just get kilojoules per kilogram. So the units do work out properly. Um, I I'm just assuming that you have all the right math skills. I mean, it's something that you worked on years ago, maybe last year, but um, you know, if anybody's really having trouble doing these kind of integrations, then well, you should see me or talk to one of your classmates or go to the Learning Resource Center and get yourself a tutor or whatever it takes, but you know, make sure you understand mathematics. All right, so any questions on part A of this problem? Okay, again, I've skipped some steps in actually plugging and chugging, but um, that's how we would do this. Now let's do part B of the problem. Again, no questions. All right, so in part B of the problem, now they're asking us to solve this at the average temperature. All right, so T average is 200 plus 800 divided by 2, which is 500 Kelvin. So this one's easy. We just go into table A2 part B at 500 Kelvin, and we simply look up, well, what are we looking for? We're looking for CV, right? We just look up the value of CV. So we've got to go to the other table now. Uh, here's hydrogen. Here's 500. Make sure the units are right. By the way, be really careful with the units. Um, like in the water and refrigerant tables, all the temperatures were Celsius. Here in these tables, the temperatures are all in Kelvin. So, you know, make sure you understand which units to use so you don't make a silly math error. Anyway, so hydrogen at 500. Um, the second column over from temperature is the CV column. And you see that it's just 10.389. And kilojoules per kilogram. Um, again, so now we find the internal energy change. And um, by the way, I should really call this CV average because it's taken at the average temperature. So now we find the internal energy change. Um, we have the general equations from before. It was equation B, I guess. Right? Um, and this is then just going to be CV average times T2 minus T1. So 10.389. Times 800 minus 200. Um, both of those are in Kelvin. And this is just going to give me 6233 kilojoules per kilogram. So there's your internal energy change. I'll underline the ones from above. Um, and you can see that we're really close. Um, we're off by what? About 40, 39 parts actually. Um, we're off by 39 parts out of 6,000. That's like two thirds of a percent. So the, the air is very, very small. Um, <coughs> let me just remind you that when you make an assumption that a gas is an ideal gas, that is just an assumption. Is any gas truly an ideal gas? Well, no, no gas is really ideal, but we can assume ideal gas relationships if our, you know, a range of properties is within, within certain bounds. Um, but it is an approximation. Um, here, I'm using an approximation. I'm already using approximations. So whenever you're using ideal gases, 
if you're only off by a fraction of a percent, that's actually really, really good. Why go through all the trouble to do all this crazy integration and polynomials when we can just find the average temperature and get a value that's perfectly good enough for our, for our purposes? So there's part B. Part C, we do much the same, but now we're going to use the data from table A2 part A. Um, and it's not going to be at any particular temperature. It's just going to be the one given in the chart. So this chart says, well, first of all, I've got the right chart. Um, all right, so we're at room temperature. We come down to hydrogen. We come across to CV. And it's 10.183. 10 kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin, and therefore the internal energy change is easily found 10.183 times 800 minus 200 over Kelvin, we get 6110. kilojoules per kilogram. Now, this is certainly off by a lot more, right? Um, we're off by, what, about 84 parts out of 6,000. That's still not bad. I mean, that's still only about one and a quarter percent error. So even if we made the assumption that it was, um, you know, okay to take CV at room temperature, our error is still rather minimal. Um, so. Again, what I would suggest is that when you're looking at problems where you need this kind of information, um, it would be best to use CV at the average temperature if you can. It's not always possible. If you can, do it. If you can't do it, then just assume room temperature data. Um, in fact, quite frankly, beyond that example problem that I've just done, I, I am not going to ask you to do any more problems of that type except one homework problem just to make sure you know how it's done. Um, but all the other problems that involve our analysis, first law analysis, we're just going to assume that we'll take CP or CV at the average temperature if it's available or at room temperature. Now, why do they say if it's available? Well, again, there's only six gases in that table, right? Um, if we don't have one of these six gases, then we're stuck. We, we have no possible way, at least without going into the literature and seeing if it's available out there somewhere in the real world, but um, at least as far as this class goes, we don't have any choice, right? If we have something like, uh, how about helium gas? You can't use the data from this table because there is no helium data in this table. So go back to table A2 part A and there's helium and just assume that you have constant value of room temperature and that will be more than satisfactory for this class. But again, that's important. Um, average temperature, first choice, if available. Room temperature, second choice. Um, and as far as your third choice, it comes in a far distant third. Um, you know, use the integration, you know, CP or CV as a function of T. Um, so are there any questions on this so far? So the integration will be the most precise answer. Yes. <coughs> All right, so let us now um, look at ideal gases and the first law. And still we're talking about closed systems. All right. So the first law is the first law. It doesn't care whether we have an ideal gas or a real gas, a liquid, uh, a solid. I mean, it's the first law. It's always the same. It's heat transfer equals change in internal energy plus kinetic and potential energy change plus the work. It, it just doesn't change. The only thing that changes now that we're talking about ideal gases is that instead of the internal energy change, we replace it with something related to the specific heat at constant volume. So this is then going to equal M and then, again, as is preferred, at least in my class, M times CV average T2 minus T1, and then plus all those other terms above, right? Kinetic energy, potential energy change, and work. So this is the equation that 
would be preferable. Uh oh, one F two R's. Okay, so that would be preferred. On the other hand, if we don't have the data available to us, we've got no choice, right? We'll say the Q12, it's still the change in internal energy, but now it's M times CV at room temperature times the temperature change. And then again, plus kinetic and potential energy. You know, I wonder why I even bother to keep writing out kinetic and potential energy. We know that for all our closed system problems, this is really going to be zero, right? There isn't a problem you've seen, and there won't be one you see where it's not zero. But um, anyway, this is our second choice, right? So this is our first law. So these are the first law. These are equations that we're going to use. And I think what you will find is that they're not really that complicated. Um, now, of course, I say that about everything, but I've done this for a long time. Um, hopefully, you'll find the same. So, any questions? Because now I, I'm ready to go through an example problem. Um, yes. Did you want uh, integration to be the third choice? Yeah, choice? but I'm never going to give you a problem where we have to do the <coughs> Okay. okay. So I'll always be able to use the data from either A2, part B, or part A. So you, you should know what the better method is. I mean, quite frankly, if you're going to go to all the trouble to do the integration, then you're going to also be able to go out into the literature in the real world, and you will find thermodynamic property tables for most gases that are out there. But I mean, it would fill up a whole volume all by itself. Um, this method is it's useful. It's simple. But I'll admit, it's a little bit outdated. I mean, when I was in college, computers existed, but I mean, it was just mainframes. Nobody had a PC. It wasn't until the 80s when, you know, people started getting PCs, and um, you just didn't have access to the kind of information that was available now. You know, you'd have to go to a library and, you know, search through, you know, volumes of books to find the kind of data that nowadays you can just find simply online. But nonetheless, this gives you a nice, easy way to solve these kinds of problems with reasonable accuracy. And, you know, it's very customary still, even though this method is somewhat dated, it still gives you good results. So, you know, we, we all still typically cover it. Um, any other questions? So this is only for uh, specific uh, heat at constant volume. This is the first law for any ideal gas problem. And yes, it uses a specific constant. Um, I'm going to give you another form of this for constant pressure processes, um, but that'll be in a few minutes after I've done with this example. Actually, it might even be Wednesday. Um, or I may have passed over it in my notes. Oh, yes, I did. Let's talk about that now. Uh, okay. What if we have a constant pressure problem? So we're still talking about ideal gas, we're still talking about first law of the system. What if we have a constant pressure process? Well, we remember that if we're at all confused, don't even worry about anything I'm about to say. You can use the general form of the first law, the one I'm going to be talking about, for any problem, even a constant pressure problem. But for constant pressure processes, I derived an ultimate version of the first law, which combined the internal energy with the constant pressure boundary work, and those combined into an enthalpy term. So the form of the first law was the mass times the change in specific enthalpy plus kinetic and potential energy changes and work. So this was, oh, I'm sorry, I should call this other work, because there may be other forms of work, like electric resistance work, or springs or shaft work or any of that kind of stuff. So this would have been the general form of the first law, but only for a constant pressure process. And you can see now we have enthalpy change instead of internal energy change. Um, there's no boundary work. Well, there is boundary work, but the boundary work isn't a separate equation, right? Or, I'm sorry, it isn't a separate term within this equation. This term here combines the internal energy change it combines the internal energy change with the boundary work, right? MP changes specific volume is the boundary work. MU2 minus U1 is the internal energy change. U plus PV2 is H2. U1 plus PV1 is H1. And, and that's why we end up with the equation that we had above. 
so I dragged it for you again. Now, we're using specific heats, so the heat transfer would equal M times CP average times the temperature change, and then plus the other terms. So again, this is our preferred equation, but if we don't have that data available to us, then we have to use the specific heat at room temperature. So CPO times the temperature change, and then plus kinetic and potential energy changes. We won't have net, plus the work. So this is my second choice. Um, so, this is what we're going to have to use as an alternative, um, but again, it's your choice, right? If you don't have um, a good understanding of the use of enthalpy, then, then don't even bother. You just use you know, the equations that involve internal energy and CV. All right, so now let's look at an example problem, and I don't know what happened. It says no signal, but my, my computer still works. Um, so this may or may not become an issue. The, the problem is pretty, pretty straightforward. If I have to, um, maybe I'll just, um, well, let me see if I pull it up here. Maybe that'll work. Um, I don't know, with mechanical stuff, I just give it a good little kick, and it always seems to work. But with electrical stuff, I'll break something. So let's just look at the problem, if we can. So this one is problem 118 from the current edition. And, um, you know, again, um, is there any way? I mean, you didn't do it, right? It just, it just happened? OK. Um, um, actually, I have the problem written here, too. Um, so I think I'll just kind of put this under. I mean, there's also a bunch of notes in my own. Chicken and scratch. I'm sorry. Yeah, right, that's good enough for now. Um, well, so at least for now, I mean, we might have to switch it back again so I can solve the problem. But any for anyway, for now, here's the problem. So, reading it to you, we have a piston cylinder device. By the way, it doesn't say that it's a frictionless vertical one, even though it shows it as being vertical. And it says it contains helium gas initially at 100 kilopascals, 10 Celsius and 0.2 cubic meters. Um, it says that the helium is now compressed in a polytropic process to 700 kilopascals, 290 degrees Celsius. Determine the heat loss or gain during this process. So we're just trying to find the value of Q. Now, um, let's just think about this problem. I know the initial temperature and pressure and I know the final temperature and pressure, so there's no problem finding the initial and final thermodynamic states. Um, I know it's polytropic, so I should be able to find the polytropic work, the boundary work, without too much difficulty. Um, we are talking about problems that involve ideal gases, right? So um, clearly I'm going to use, well, in this case, um, specific heat at constant volume. Um, I'm going to use the, the CV value, um, and I would either use it at the average temperature or at room temperature, although we've already seen that there is no helium data in Table A2 Part B, so I, I kind of have to use the data at room temperature. I have no choice unless I want to go through that entire integration. So, you know, just talking about it logically, I should be able to solve the problem really quite easily, right? I, I know my initial final state. I, I know the equations for work. I have the first law equation. For heat transfer, I know my internal energy is related to the specific heat, so everything is known to me. The problem's not difficult, but um, it's not as straightforward or obvious as you might think. So let's talk about that problem. And um, now I think I'm going to have to switch us back to oh, it worked again. Uh, Electronics. It's good being a mechanical engineer. Mechanical stuff either fails catastrophically or it works just fine. <laughs> Electrical stuff is kind of wiggly. All right, so is that the right word? Works. So this is 4118. And as I set up this problem, I'll start 
with my piston cylinder device. I'll identify the equations and the data that I have. So I know that it's helium gas. Um, we are going to assume that it's an ideal gas. In fact, we're not going to talk about the use of any kind of real gas tables for gases like this. So we're always going to assume that these are ideal gas problems. So anytime you have a problem that deals with a gas and the first law, just assume it's an ideal gas and use the material that we're talking about now. Um, I guess the only real exception would be if we have water or the refrigerant 134A, in which case I've already stated, you always want to use the tables for water or R134A. But if you have any other random gas like helium, then just assume that it's an ideal gas. Um, we know initial conditions, P1 and P1, um, 10 Celsius under kilopascals. We know the initial volume as 0.2 cubic meters. We are told that it's a polytropic process. And it increases to a pressure of 700. So P2 is 700 kilopascal and a temperature of 290 <laughs> Celsius. Okay. And we are trying to find okay. Now, let us note that we can't use A2 part B because there is no helium data. So we just have to use data um, from table A2 part A, um, which assumes that it's a constant value CV at room temperature. Um, please make a note that I would <coughs> rather use A2 part B. I'd rather find the data at the average temperature. I, I know the initial and final temperature, so there's no problem finding the average temperature. It's just 150, but I don't have the data. So I've got no choice, right? So my preference is to use something I can't use. This is my second choice. All right, so that's where we're going to get our data. I'll get that in just a moment. Um, as far as the equations, well, let's see. The first law tells me that I'm going to use this equation. And then we have kinetic and potential energy changes, and then plus the work. Um, let's just note right away that kinetic and potential energy changes are zero, uh, but the work is certainly not zero, right? It's, it's boundary work, um, and it's a polytropic process, so I'm going to have to find the equation for the polytropic work. But I don't really know everything I need yet. For instance, I just don't know yet what the polytropic exponent is, so we're going to have to figure out how to do that too. Anyway, let's continue. So what about the mass? Well, the mass I'm going to need but I can use one of the versions of the ideal gas equation to state. Um, since I'm given pressure, volume, and temperature at point one, why don't I just use all that point one data to get the mass? So that's how I'm going to find the mass for this problem. Um, how am I going to find the polytropic exponent? Let's think about that. P1, V1 to the N equals P2, V2 to the N. Um, I can rearrange this a little bit. I can write this as P2 over P1, and this is just going to equal V1 over V2 <coughs> to the N. Now, I do know P1 and P2, and I know V1. Is there some way, perhaps, that I could solve for V2? If I can solve for V2 somehow, then I could just plug it into this equation and I only have a single unknown, which is a polytropic exponent. And then once I know what that value is, if n equals 1, I use one particular form of the boundary work equation, right? If n equals anything else, then I use the other form of the boundary work equation. But, but I do need to know what n is. Now, I'm thinking some of you are going to say, well, n is equal to 1, right? We saw a problem last week um, where a ideal gas undergoing some process turned out to be a polytropic process with n equal to 1. But that was specifically an isothermal process for an ideal gas, right? In other words, T1 equals T2. And it was only for the isothermal process that you're able to use that particular 
relationship, right? That allows you to find n equal to one. This is not isothermal. I mean, the temperature is rising. It's rising quite a bit, so we, we can't do that. But there's got to be something else. Well, we actually have it. it. It comes from this mass equation above, right? The mass is the mass. We can apply the ideal gas equation at point one, but we can also apply the ideal gas equation at point two, can we? Can we write this as P2V2 over RT2? Isn't that also going to equal the mass? And if I have some intermediate point, I can write it as P3V3 over RT3. Um, any point for this system is going to have the same mass, identified by the same equation. But if you look at this equation, you'll see that everything is known. The R's are going to cancel. P1 is known. V1 is known. P2, T2, T1, they're all known. The only unknown is V2. So I can solve this equation above for two things. I can solve it for the mass, and I can solve it for the final volume. And once I have the final volume, then I plug it in below, and I can solve for n. Now, once we go through the mathematics, which we'll do here shortly, you will find that n is not going to equal 1, and then we'll be able to write the appropriate equation. So we're pretty much ready to go with the problem. Let's now go into our tables and find the data that we need. Um, we are definitely going to need our value of CVO. So, um, whoa. All right, so again, there's no hydrogen data in part B, so I gotta go to part A. And here's helium, and it gives me the value of CV. So that's three, 3.1156 kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin. Um, and you know, we're also gonna need the gas constant to find the mass. And like for us, the gas constant data is in this table as well. I mean, it is in table A1, we've seen that, but it's also here. So that's 2.0769. Also kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin. All right, so that's the data we're going to need. Um, that's all the data we're going to need. We don't need anything else. All right, so let me just slide this up. All right, so what's next? Um, let, let's just take the numbers we have and start plugging away. So the mass is P1V1 over RT1. Gosh, I've only got like three minutes. You know, I'm just going to forego the plugging away, and I'll just let you plug in the numbers at home. Um, so if you plug in all the numbers, um, again, I'll just let you do the mathematics. Um, we end up with a mass of 0 0.03403 kilograms. <coughs> again, we have P1, we have V1, we have T1, we have R. They're all known or given. So the mass is now found. Now let's go to the equation P1V1 over RT1 equals P2V2 over RT2. It's the same equation we use for the mass. And we'll solve this for V2. And in solving for V2, again, you'll have to do this on your own at home. You get 0 0.05684 for cubic meters. So that term is now known. Now we go to the equation for the polytropic process. So P2 over P1. Those V2 over V1 to the N. Um, again, we know everything, right? The only thing we don't know is N. So I'll let you solve this. Um, by the way, you might want to practice how to do that on your calculator, because you probably have to use your inverse exponent function. Um, you know, it's not as obvious. Or you, you can always use logarithms, which is how I learned how to do it back in junior high school. But that was even before electronic calculators. So I had a slide rule and all that, so that was a lot of fun. Um, but uh, it certainly got easier over the years. Nonetheless, you can solve this for n. We have 1.547. Um, so again, you, you can do it however you want, but you'll get that result. Now that we have n, now we can state that 
the work from 1 to 2, which is a boundary work, is P2V2 minus P1V1 over 1 minus N. So again, plug in the numbers, make sure you have your units worked out properly. Um, all, all the results are known here. And um, we get minus 36.19 kilojoules. Okay. Um, so there's the boundary work. And then the last thing we really need to do is find the heat transfer. So the heat transfer is CBO, whoops, mass, CBO, T2 minus T1. Um, we've already seen that there's no kinetic or potential energy change. So once again, it's really just a matter of you plugging in all the numbers. We have M now, we have CV, we have the temperature change, uh, we have the work. Um, just, just go through the mathematics and we end up with a negative 6.51 joules. So lastly, um, let's just make sure that the numbers seem to make physical sense. Um, we know that the volume is moving from 0.2 to 0.05, so the volume is clearly shrinking, meaning work is being done to the system, which is negative work, and we did get a negative work term here. Um, Okay, so there's a lot of energy coming into the system as work. Um, the minus sign tells us that heat is being lost. Now, this is something that might be a little confusing. Heat is being lost from the system, yet the temperature is going up hugely from 10 to 290 degrees Celsius. That's, that's a lot. How is it that you can have heat being rejected, yet the temperature is increasing? Well, it's not as inconsistent as you might think, and it has to do with the work, right? The work is a form of energy that's being added to the system, right? The negative tells you the work's being done to the system. So there's like six times more work, you know, energy being added as work than the heat that's being lost. Um, so your net input of energy is energy input into the system, right? Um, and there's more than enough energy being added into the system to increase the temperature by that significant amount and to increase the pressure from 100 up to 700. So, you know, you might look at that heat transfer as a negative and say, I, I must have done something wrong, but you really didn't do something wrong. It is negative. You are going to be losing some heat. Most of the work input is going to the temperature and pressure rise. Um, some of the energy input from work is being lost as heat, and, and that's actually broken. So that's all the time we have for today. Thank you.